Uh, today I'm going to talk about something that's been occupying a lot of my life over the last couple of years, uh, and particularly looking at how we're implementing genomics into clinical practice. Now, I wasn't sure about the audience, um, but I, I, I thought I'd start off with a bit of a primer of, of why genomics currently is such a disruptive technology. Um, and perhaps before I go into that, I'll, I'll talk about a personal perspective of how I got into this area. As Steve mentioned, um, I have a long history in working with rare disease, um, particularly neuromuscular disease. And, you know, classically, I'd see my patients in clinic. Uh, we, if they didn't have Duchenne spinal muscular atrophy or a, um, a common neuropathy, then we were stuck without a diagnosis. And our initial studies looking at diagnostic rates um, in the late 90s, uh, we could get about a 10% diagnosis. And even looking uh, at, you know, 10 years later, we're still only hitting about 20 to 25% diagnostics. And the patients were really, you know, you'd see them for 10 years, you'd watch them grow up, you still could not provide an answer. Sorry, I need the microphone plugged to you. Oh, okay. Sorry about this. And, uh, and really what we aimed, at, what we continued doing is we'd look at their, they'd have invasive muscle biopsies, and then we'd sequence their genes one by one by one as they were discovered. Then around sort of 2010, 2011, uh, was when um, the, the really the next gen sequencing started to become more freely available. And for me as a clinician scientist, um, with a research lab looking at these rare disorders, um, suddenly we were hitting 50 to 60% diagnostic rates and providing answers for families. And it was, you know, it's a wonderful time to be working in this area. Um, but when I moved to Melbourne at the beginning of 2013, and part of my institute is the Victorian Clinical Genetic Service, uh, I, I did start to think, how do we actually get this into clinical practice? Government is, is scared of genomics because they think it's just going to be horribly expensive without seeing the particular savings that it can provide. Uh, and how, it, rather than paying for it um, in a research setting with grants or philanthropic funding, how do we actually get this as part of the health system? And you know, how do we actually deal with these huge amounts of information, but deal with it in a hospital setting? So I, I'm really going to focus on that today and talk about what is happening both internationally, um, what we're doing locally, um, and what we're doing nationally. So the challenge is that the human genome is equivalent to a thousand copies of War and Peace. So we've got these huge amounts of information um, that we're trying to make sense of and to store and to analyze. And I think that <laughs> this is something that, uh, just, to, just to convey um, the immensity of the information that we're dealing with, and also thinking about the data infrastructure, the bioinformatics, um, how to make sense of the 99% that's not the coding region, um, which is becoming increasingly important, particularly in cancers. What really, I, I'll just jump through this because I think this is probably well known in this audience, is that with next-gen sequencing, um, it's really given us the ability um, to very quickly and rapidly um, be able to sequence every single gene instead of doing them one at a time, as I did for 15 years in my research laboratory. Um, but then it's the element of making sense of it. But also we've got, I, I gave a talk a couple of years ago to an international pediatric conference. And I, I can tell you the pediatric workforce is really not um, upskilled in to be able to interpret um, the reports they get from a genomic perspective. Uh, I think the other issue that we find is that um, a lot of the, the genome is still Russian. Um, we don't know what it means. And really uh, only be, by being <clears throat> able to share data on millions of genomes and look how it relates to, to particular disease, co uh, disease causes. So if you find a variant, is it benign? Is it associated with disease? If it's associated with disease, what's its penetrance? Um, what's the likelihood you'll get disease? And when you think about something like breast cancer, if, if you've got a, a variant that's been associated with um, breast cancer, or that could be associated with breast cancer, you want to know whether it's a 1% risk, a 50% risk, or a 95% risk, because you're going to decide whether you have a bilateral mastectomy based on that data. The other big change is that you can see this only goes up to 2011, but um, the Human Genome Project took 13 years and cost $3 billion 
to sequence the first human genome. Um, the cost has decreased dramatically and really now with the, um, you know, the next gen sequencing that's now available in Melbourne through AGRF, um, really the cost of the chemicals, not the end-to-end -end interpretation, <clears throat> is down to about $700. And uh, it can be done, we're working on turnarounds for some disorders of two to five days. So this is, is just an incredible, um, it's an incredible step forward. And I love this analogy, is what has happened as we have a disruptive technology is the price to sequence DNA has fallen millions of times. So it's like buying a, um, a tank of petrol in 1998, um, but waiting for about 15 years. And now you could use that tank to drive to Jupiter and back. That is an amazing change over a brief period of time. So the other thing is then what are the benefits that we talk about? For rare disease, it's um, very much related to faster diagnosis. All those patients of mine that were coming back to see me every couple of years to try and get a diagnosis, um, you can, we've got a number of cases now and they're growing where you can intervene early and prevent severe disability. I think we will move to, and very much so in cancer already, where we're providing targeted therapies and this concept of precision or personalised medicine. Um, but I, I think also as we start to use um, very well characterised population cohorts and look at gene environment interaction, the ASPRI cohort here, for example, a number of our both cohorts that, um, that with longitudinal studies that we're looking at, these are going to be invaluable for providing information about how we might intervene early um, or with the focus on improving human health. So <clears throat> that's a primer. Um, and now I'll leap into to what's actually happening. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, um, because that is really looking at how we can start to address these huge issues of the millions of samples that are now being sequenced that are typically sitting in silos. Um, you know, I've got a big database in my lab of all the exomes I've sequenced on my patients. Um, and that happens by country, by institution. And the only way we're going to actually harp, um, reap the benefit of all this information is if it can be shared. Analysis needs to be standardised, it needs to be at scale, it needs to be quality control because it needs to be within the health system, not the sort of suck it and see attitude that you can sometimes have in terms of repeating your sequencing, looking at a particular variant in a research laboratory. Uh, and then the, there is all the issues that we have to look at, particularly when we're taking things on a population or screening level, is looking at the ethics, um, the legislative barriers to sharing of information, making sure that people are informed with their consent and that they know what they're getting themselves into before they get what could be potentially life-changing information. I think the, one, the other thing I ne really need to put out there is that there has been a huge focus on the importance of sequencing, um, that there is the grunt, the capacity, the cost. But the rate limiting steps are not the sequencing. That's going to change and everything I'm going to talk about um, is, is really agnostic of the technology that is being used because it's all of these other things that we have to pay attention to. Um, upskilling the workforce, um, really looking at that end to end of going from informed consent into the laboratory, being able to do quality control across laboratories in terms of sequencing ability, um, having the bioinformaticians using the very best in terms of uh, pipelines um, for curating variants, um, and then bringing it back to the patient, back with the clinician, back with the scientists and the bioinformaticians to actually then prioritise what are the most likely pathogenic candidates. And then probably using functional genomics to actually work out whether particular variants are disease causing or not. So the goal of uh, what we've been doing globally and what we've been doing locally is to move um, genomics out of the laboratory where we do it sort of fast, we do it in a focused way, we're not really looking on reproducibility, to getting something that's much more reliable that um, you feel safe um, to use and to counsel your patients based on that information. So again, this is my, my government mantra is a whole of system change is required. So with Australian Genomics, we've built very much on this experience from the Global Alliance, um, but also looked at how we bring all the state initiatives together so that we become 
uh, have a one national approach and that we can consider Australia as a cohort of 25 million people, which is what's really going to make us attractive um, as we're dealing with pharma, with industry, uh, and, and looking at how we make our patients clinical trial ready. Uh, but also, I, I think we have to um, really use the brilliance of our researchers uh, and look at the, how we can be innovative from the point of view of functional genomics, um, improving diagnosis, but also starting to develop those targeted therapies. So the Global Alliance was formed in uh, 2013, actually launched in 2014. And uh, really all of these things I'm going to talk about have all happened at the same time over this last couple of years. And the Global Alliance was actually formed with Francis Collins brought together a group of people um, in New York to, to really look at what was necessary to be able to harness the power of genomics. And so the mission of the Global Alliance is to develop a common framework and also the standards um, to enable effective and responsible sharing of both genomic and clinical data. Uh, and, and that we've actually just done a, um, a four year review and a strategic plan for the next five years. And still very much that is the mission of the Global Alliance. Um, there's actually now over 500 partner organisations in, in over 40 countries now. Uh, and it's supported very much by, um, I think I've got the advisory board here, um, Harold Varmus, who will be out here later this year. Um, Francis Collins from NIH, um, it's really involving the people from the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, the Broad Institute um, and the Wellcome Trust, oh sorry I've said that twice, but um, these are all providing the sort of background support and it's also um, engaging with the big producers of data uh, but also how we link out into the patient community. Um, the, I, I won't go into all the initiatives of the Global Alliance but you can check it out on the website. Uh, genomicsandhealth.org. Um, I've been running the, the clinical working group. Um, David Hausler um, from uh, California has been leading the data initiatives. Bartha Noppers uh, in terms of ethics and regulation and developing of um, the uh, national, international framework um, and a code of conduct for the responsible sharing of data. And uh, one thing I particularly like about that is it's involving over 30 countries have agreed to it. And it's based on a 1948 Human Bill of Rights um, that says it's a basic human right to benefit from advances in health and medical research. So that's sort of a bit different from sometimes the risk averse concerns that people have about the sharing of data. This is really looking at the public good related to sharing of data. Uh, and then of course data security, Paul Flycheck based, based at EBI um, in the UK. I've, um, but particularly over the, um, the last couple of years, we've been focusing on real practical ways um, to demonstrate the benefits of sharing of data. I'll talk a bit about Matchmaker, um, but the BRCA exchange is really linking up all of the sources of mutational information about the breast cancer gene that are available. And uh, doing that in partnership with expert curation uh, and developing an app and a website so that a clinician can go in and actually look at what is known about a particular variant uh, and trying to make that information as accurate as possible. Um, the, the thing is, when you think of the scale of that, it's, it's um, two genes down, 19,998 to go. But, but that's exactly what we need. This is aiming for Google Genome, that you can actually sit as a clinician or a researcher, put in your gene of interest or a variant, and actually be able to ping all of the world's knowledge. Um, Matchmaker Exchange, um, I'll just use as the one example of the work of the Global Alliance. And as a rare disease physician, um, what we've tended to use over the years um, is all these different databases that um, store in their, their silos, although you can go in and access them individually, um, matched clinical and genotype information um, about a patient. And the, the goal of Matchmaker Exchange, again, is this, you know, the, the Google genome approach, is that you use one portal and can put in a phenotype of interest or a genotype of interest, and it will ping all of these different federated um, databases to provide you with a match and to provide you with an answer. And that's a great, a great time saver. Um, certainly in the early days when I was using um, sequencing, genomic sequencing in research, 
um, the way you did this was to email your mates and see if they had a mutation or if they'd found this as a gene of interest in any of their patient cohorts. But this is really speeding up the entire process. It demonstrates a lot of the principles of the Global Alliance, um, which is to, to really build on what exists, um, to, to build paths within existing systems, um, but really looking at federating existing data. There isn't going to be one database to rule them all. Uh, we need to be able to go into all these different sources of data including those that sit behind hospital firewalls um, and bring the analysis to the data uh, so that, that we can really um, use it to its maximum benefit. Uh, this is my last slide on the Global Alliance and this is the result of um, a recent three-day planning meeting that we had in Cambridge um, that is looking at where we want to be in the next five years. And this is certainly where we all want to be in the next five years is that we'll have genomic data on tens of millions of in individuals um, that's responsibly accessible um, using the quality standards um, and using the tools um, that have been developed through the Global Alliance and its partners. The vast majority of this data is likely to be uh, generated in healthcare versus up to date, the vast majority has been generated in research and that these genomes are also available for secondary use from a research perspective. Data that can be shared will be shared, um, but always respecting the consent and the wishes of the individual. Uh, genomic data uh, is integrated into clinical records and that there everyone is working together uh, in terms of how this data is brought together. So, that what we've aimed to do as we build up our local and national genomics initiatives is to continually interface with what's happening internationally. So we're making sure we're always using um, best practice uh, in how we're sharing this data. Now, in 2015, um, the NHMRC put out a targeted call um, for uh, genomics. Um, and the basic goals of this targeted call for research uh, I put these up because it's demonstrating that this is very much at the implementation and health services research end of the spectrum. I always think of this, Australian Genomics is a big health services research project basically, because you need, it's about demonstrating patient benefit through the application of genomic data, its cost effectiveness, the practical strategies for implementation, um, but at the same time looking at how it interfaces with our research and research translational capacity. And the way we've really looked at building this up is by um, partnering with and leveraging all of the different state initiatives as well. Uh, the, the NHMRC TCR was $25 million, so it's $5 million a year. Um, just by comparison, Genomics England budget is £330 million pounds, um, over the same period. So uh, it's still uh, on the smell of an oily rag. Um, what we have done is looking across all of these different state initiatives is um, develop shared models and shared approaches um, and uh, make sure that we're being complementary rather than duplicating um, across, uh, across the different states. So Melbourne Genomics you would probably be familiar with, but I just want to highlight um, some learnings from the Melbourne Genomics. Uh, as it has really um, set the scene, I'll go into a little bit of detail because we're using this as the baseline model for now what we're rolling out nationally. And Melbourne Genomics' goal was to develop a statewide platform so that we can share and interchange data between our hospitals, our universities and our institutions. Um, whereas Australian Genomics is really looking at how we do that um, across state borders. Um, the demonstration project, which was the first 18 months to two years, was looking at developing a prototype system um, and then looking at what worked, what didn't, uh, and, and making changes in an iterative way, but very much developing shared approaches, and it's been very successful from that perspective. The first demonstration project study was with um, its prospective recruitment. So it's not about going and sequencing the DNA in your fridge or your freezer. It's about doing this in real time as patients present prospectively into the clinic. Um, there were five initial flagships, and the point of the flagships is to address specific questions 
um, all disorders are not equal when it comes to genomics in terms of the evidence of benefit or how they've been applied in either um, research or a clinical setting. And um, back then, we'd probably do this with whole genome sequencing now, but planning this in 2013, um, the, the genomic arm was using whole exome sequencing uh, and a targeted analysis of associated disease genes, but done in parallel with the usual investigations. So the patients acted as their own control. What difference did it make if or if you didn't actually do a genomic test as part of the diagnostic workup? Out of this has really come um, the prototypes for shared consent data standards um, brought together for the first time um, the, uh, across a number of different institutions, the bioinformaticians to actually start to work on clinical pipelines, um, common <coughs> um, report format, and also bringing together as training um, clinicians, bioinformaticians, and laboratory scientists to interpret the data. And, and really this has been, um, it's really been training in action uh, in terms of uh, over 50 clinicians were trained um, in genomic interpretation as part of that initial uh, demonstration project. Um, the headlines from this were that um, patients accepted genomic sequencing. There's very high rates of consent and this is using, looking at its use within a clinical setting. Very importantly, patients agreed to share their genomic data, um, and this is part of local, national, and internationally accessible databases. So 93% agreed to share their genomic data for any research. And in, I think the other thing that um, is a benefit of genomic sequencing and having that genome stored is that you can reinterrogate it as new genes become available um, to increase the diagnostic output. I think this is the one that the, um, the governments pay attention to, is that this was looking, remember this is the group of patients presenting in the first year or two of life with a likely Mendelian disorder, the childhood syndromes group. And for this same group using traditional diagnostics um, and single gene testing, if it was available, the rate of diagnosis was 11%. Um, but the same group of patients, if you added in the whole exome sequencing uh, with a targeted analysis, same group of patients was five times the diagnosis and it, um, at about a quarter of the cost. So this, you know, this is the poster child of genomic sequencing and not all diseases are the same. Um, but really this demonstrates to government um, that although all of these tests are billable to Medicare and this is not, um, it's really, and that's what we need to change. Um, it's really uh, the demonstrable benefits within the rare disease group is, is quite striking. Uh, and in the basis for this, we've actually taken through an application to MSAC, which is where they look at the clinical utility of a new diagnostic um, with the goal of how this might be funded sustainably within the healthcare system. Um, the other thing that we're currently um, looking at is a solu solution architecture to genomic data management and how we can do this in a whole of state way um, and, and in a way that's going to be um, readily accessible for clinicians and researchers, um, but also shareable nationally and internationally. Um, Sydney Genomics has, was funded um, to the tune of 25 million by the New South Wales government and that's had a different focus, which has been very much um, using the X10 at the Garvin and building up a capacity in whole genome sequencing. Um, but that also has been a, a great learning tool in terms of the complexities of dealing with and the interpretation of whole genome data um, that now we're bringing into the national initiative um, as we also are ramping up because whole genome sequencing will be the baseline that we've used um, and we now have a capacity in Victoria just of the last month or two um, where we have a capacity to do 30,000 whole genomes um, a year. So, uh, it, so it's, it's probably double the capacity now of the X10. And Queensland um, has also signed an MOU with Melbourne Genomics. Their government's also thrown in 25 million and uh, they're just kicking off to, to aim to emulate what's happened across Victoria. Um, from a state basis while also linking in with the national initiative. So finally, what have we been doing? Um, we were awarded the, uh, the NHMRC started in 2016 
Um, and it's very much is driven in a similar way to Melbourne genomics, which is why I spent time on that. But again, I, I just wanted to spend the last 10 minutes um, just going through what we have been doing and what we've achieved um, in bringing, trying, to, trying to roll this out on a national basis and make Australia a node as part of um, all of the international activity. So um, the, the principles and goals uh, are, are really looking at how we um, re really look across all of that complexity of our health system linking into research uh, to, to build that capacity for genomics across the state, uh, across the, the country. Um, because you still, you know, you still only get access to it if you happen to luck out and be in a centre where it's readily available. So it's a big problem with equity of access. Um, we're aiming for a sort of federated national approach. Uh, and again, it's that principle almost of the matchmaker exchange of how do we link up all of the different, um, all of the different information that's available. How do we minimise um, duplication? How do we create national referral centres for specific disease areas? Um, as a neurologist, I've, uh, if you wanted to do white blood cell enzymes for lysosomal storage diseases, um, the test was sending blood to Adelaide uh, because that was the national referral laboratory for that particular test. Uh, and really, we need to be doing that with genomics as well. Every state will have a capability to do what I would consider routine, uh, which is to do the sequencing and then run a bioinformatics analysis to look if you get an easy answer. That's probably going to work for about 40 to 50% of cases currently. That proportion will increase, um, but we really then need to work with specialist um, laboratories and with people that know the genes involved. For example, in neuromuscular disease, um, the really national reference laboratory is Pathwest in Perth, run by Nigel Lang. Um, and they have a wealth of experience with dealing with some of the really gnarly neuromuscular disease genes. Uh, we're, what we've also done is we've obviously leveraged all of that state investment, um, but all of the flagships that we're running are leveraging where there have been um, at least uh, networks across a number of states, particularly ones that have centres for research excellence or programs, so that uh, we've got this you know, ready group of people who are used to seeing patients with certain disorders in a clinic um, taking it into the laboratory to do the analysis, you know, along the lines of what I described for my neuromuscular um, research in my neuromuscular clinic, uh, so that you then have this ready interface between uh, clinical practice and, um, and research. Uh, because I think that virtuous cycle of one to the other is going to be continuing for the next decades in the areas of genomics um, as we make sense of all of this information. Uh, and also then making sure that we are linked in internationally, um, that we are on the international scene, and I think we've already achieved that. Uh, these are the partners. There were 81 CIs on the Australian Genomics Grant. Um, we had eight weeks to get that together, so obviously there's been a lot of background work going in terms of round tables over the previous 12 to 18 months um, in, uh, to, to really do a SWOT analysis of what was happening in genomics in Australia. Um, importantly, we have international partners, um, the peak professional bodies are involved, um, but also we're utilising national infrastructure such as the National Computational Infrastructure, CSIRO and AGRF. This is the overview of the program of work um, and the programs are really the infrastructures that we're aiming to set up. So that national referral network that I talked about that's linking the diagnostic laboratories um, with the research networks. And we now have a clinical diagnostic network that involves all the clinical and diagnostic genetics laboratories around the country. And that is then mirrored by a functional genomics network where all the researchers that are working in different areas or matchmaking service between clinicians and functional genomicists because we're going to need to bring things like RNA-seq into the diagnostic pipeline and working out the best way to do that. Um, the national approach to how we, you know, we have a, a national approach to how we're sharing and storing data. The analysis and evaluation in terms of policy, health economics and uh, implementation. And then the um, ethical issues, and we have both uh, legal approaches there and ethicists involved uh, and how we upskill our workforce. And all of this activity is driven prospectively from patients being recruited in real time through clinics. 
Program one, um, I think I've, I've really covered, um, but we have a number of projects involved in terms of really formalising these national networks. Um, we have, during our first year, uh, now have a national ethics in place and a national consent form um, that is, is now um, just awaiting governance in Western Australia, but apart from that, um, is, is established around the country. Um, the Functional Genomics Network I've talked about, um, but that's been a great way to bring together people working on particular organisms, particular disease areas and particular pathways. Um, and we have a project officer who's really looking at how we bring all of that together. So if you have a gene of interest, you can again be matchmaked or ma match made with, um, a, with researchers who can work with you to define the pathogenicity of that variant. The work between the data working group and the um, clinical and diagnostic laboratories is really looking at what the diagnostic labs need. And so we have task teams that are looking at all of these different areas in terms of how we capture clinical data, um, variant curation and common reporting tools. Um, the flagships um, are really the things that are driving the research. And again, where we have some that are national and some that are predominantly state-based. And this is a list um, of all of the different flagships that are now um, established and funded through a variety of sources um, across all of the different, uh, the dark blue is the Australian Genomics, light blue is Melbourne Genomics, um, the Sydney Genomics Collaborative and what's about to start off in Queensland. So you can see we're crossing a wide range of diseases now. Each one has different specific questions um, related to diagnostic utility and how we evaluate it from an economic perspective. Um, but this is, this, uh, is it's quite, from a coordination perspective, it's um, quite entertaining. Um, we work very closely with state and federal government, but particularly federal government, with an implementation committee that is, um, has represent, is led by the DEPSEC um, in the Department of Health, who has the portfolio of genomics and has representatives from all the major acts, as I call them, the Health Minister's Advisory Committee, MSAC, PBAC, and a consumer advisory group. And we're really looking how we can speed through uh, an approach. And we've also worked with state, federal government to develop a national genomics policy framework um, that is really looking at how we're going to implement this and importantly, how we're going to fund this as from a state and federal partnership perspective. And then finally, the workforce in education. This is really training in action, um, but we are also working um, internationally uh, to share educational resources. Um, I, I might end just to talk about the Global Consortium and as part of my role in the Global Alliance, um, we've been bringing together um, all the national initiatives um, that are really starting to try and do the same thing, many of which have just started with big sequencing projects, um, but are then thinking, oh my God, how do we integrate this into the healthcare system? Um, and uh, in May of this year, um, Australian Genomics and Genomics England co-hosted a meeting um, at the Wellcome Trust that brought together 14 different countries um, and really are looking at how we um, focus and share resources um, from a data sharing perspective uh, and how we sort of encourage our governments in terms of advocacy um, for bringing this into clinical practice. So a lot of this is about engaging internationally and we now have formal partnerships, particularly with Genomics England um, and likely with Genome Canada um, so that we can share resources and also pull data between us. So, um, I'll finish on this slide. Um, this is really what we've been doing from the Australian genomics perspective. Um, the funding starting here from the Australian genomics in, um, in January of last year, um, but really building on work that's been done um, from state-based initiatives. Uh, it might be a bit hard to read, but we started with one staff member in 2014 and we now have um, 55 staff members funded through the group. We've mainly, we've mainly invested um, in putting genetic counsellors and health informaticians and coordinators in each state to really drive this um, proactive, prospective activity. Uh, we started off with uh, 50 investigators in 2014 um, and it keeps growing. There's now over 230 investigators involved in Australian genomics around the country. Um, we've gone from 30 to 80 partner institutions 
um, where our recruitment is now taking off. It was a bit delayed by getting, everyone wanted to wait for the national ethics to get in place. Everyone knows what that's like, but that is now in place and the recruitment is taking off exponentially. Uh, and we've also just formed, as well as working with the federal government on a national health policy genomics framework, we also have just partnered with the Australian Digital Health Agency um, to look at how we can start to integrate genomics into the, the My Health record as it gets rolled out. So um, I will end there and I'm very happy to answer any questions. <laughs>